What about human relations? You mentioned finding love. Are the flaws in humans, the imperfection in humans, a component of love? Like what role do you think the, the flaws play? It's a, that's a really profound question. I think the flaws are there uh, to the flaws are there to present a, a, a vulnerability. And those flaws are um, are um, a, a sign of those vulnerabilities. And I think love is very, very gentle, right? Love, with Bill, we often talk about, between the two of us, about what drives all human behavior. And for him, it's incentive, <laughs> as you might expect. <laughs> and he will repeat this sentence to me, all incentive drives all human behavior. Mm -hmm. But I, I would say to me, it's love, lo very much so. Um, and... And I think flaws are part of that because flaws eh, are a sign of that vulnerability, mm -hmm. whether physical, whether emotional vulnerability. And those vulnerabil these vulnerabilities, they either tear us apart or they bring us together. Mm -hmm. um, the vulnerability is what is the glue, I think. I think that the vulnerability enables connection. The connection is the glue. And that connection enables accessing a higher ground as a community as opposed to as an individual. So if there is a society of the mind or if there are higher levels of awareness that can be accessed um, in community as opposed to, again, going to the silkworm, as opposed to on the individual level, I think that those occur through the flaws and the vulnerabilities. And without them, we, we cannot find connection, community, and without community, we can't build what we have built as a civilization, you know, for the past hundreds of thousands of years. So I think not only are they beautiful, but they have a functional role in, in building civilizations. Yeah, I, there's a sense in which love requires vulnerability and maybe love is the leap into that vulnerability. And I think, yes, I think a flaw, think about it like physically, I'm thinking about a brick that's flawed, but in a way, the the I think of a flaw as a as an increased surface area. Ah, <laughs> yeah, that's a good line. That's a good right, line. Right, a surface area that, Ooh, like, physically, that's a good or line. emotionally, yeah. right? It yeah. it sort of introduces this whole new dimension to a human or a yeah. brick, and because you have more surface area, you can, you know, <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> use mortar and build a home, and and yeah, I think of it as accessing this additional dimension of surface area that could be used for good or bad, right? To 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 connect, to communicate, to collaborate. It makes me think of that quote from this incredible movie I've watched years ago, Particle Fever, I think it was called, a documentary about the Large Hydron Collider, mm -hmm. an incredible film, where they talk about the things that are least important for our survival are the things that make us human. <laughs> like the, the pure romantic act or, you know, the, the notion of, and, and Viktor Frankl talks about that too. He talks about feeling the sun on his arms as he's as he is um, working the soil in two degrees Fahrenheit with without clothes, and the officer berates him and says, well, "What have you done? Have, have you been a businessman before you came here to the camp?" And he says, I was a doctor. And he said, you, you must have made a lot of money as a doctor. And he said, I, all, all my work I've done for free, I've been helping the poor. Um, but he keeps his, he keeps his um, humility and he, ke he keeps his um, modesty and he keeps his preservation of the spirit. Um, and he says the things that actually make him able to, or made him able to outlive the the terrible um, experience in the Holocaust was the the 
really cherishing this moment when the sun hits his skin or when he can eat a, um, a grain of rice, a single grain of rice. So I think cherishing is a very important part of um, living a meaningful life, being able to cherish those simple things. Like to notice them and to... To notice them, to pay attention to them in the moment. And I I do this now more than ever. I mean, there is some... some the Bukowski has this poem I like called Nirvana, where it t tells the story of a young man on a bus going through like North Carolina or something like this, and they stop off in a cafe. And he has this... There's a waitress and just... He, he talks about that he notices the magic something indescribable we just knows it's the magic of it. And he gets back on the bus with the rest of the passengers and none of them seem to have noticed the magic. And I think if you just allow yourself to pause and just to feel whatever that is, maybe maybe ultimately it's a kind of gratitude. Yes. For, I don't know what it is. It's just that, I'm sure it's just chemicals in the brain, but it's just, so incredible to be alive yes. and noticing that yes. and appreciating that and being one in that with others. Yes, yes. And and that goes back to, you know, to the fireplace, right? To the first technology. <laughs> what was the first technology? It was fire. First technology to have built community. And it emerged out of a vulnerability of wanting to stay away from the cold and be warm together. And, and and of course, that fire is associated with not only with comfort and the ability to uh, form, you know, bio-relevant nutrients in our food and 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 provide heat and, and comfort, but also spirits and and um, a kind of a way to enter, a, you know, to enter a spiritual moment, to enter. A, a moment that can only be experienced as as in a community as a as a form of med, a meditative moment. There is a lot to be said about light. Light um, is, I think, an important part of these moments. Of, I think, I, I think it's a real thing. I, I really truly believe that we're born with an with a with an aura surface area that is measurable. I think we're we're born into the world with a, you know, with a with an aura. And um and how do we channel that is really is, is sort of ends I mean and ends up sort of defining you know defining the light in our in our lives. Do you think we're all do you think we're all lonely? Do you think there's loneliness in us humans? Oh yes. Yes, loneliness is part. Yes, I think we we all have that loneliness whether we're willing to access that loneliness and look at it in the eye or completely um you know, completely avoid it or deny it. I, it's like uh it feels like it's a it's some kind of foundation for longing and longing leads to this uh this combination of vulnerability and and connection with others. Yes. It feels like that's a really important part of being human is being lonely. Very. It's very, we are born into this world alone. Again, being alone and being lonely are two different things, right? And you can be together, but be lonely. And you can be alone, but not be lonely at all. <laughs> we often joke, Bill and I, that um, he he cannot be lonely. He cannot deal with being by himself. He always needs people around him. And I strive long um, must have creative solitude, must find pockets of solitude and loneliness in order to find creativity and reconnect with myself. So loneliness is a recipe for um, for community, in my opinion, mm -hmm. and I think those things complement each other and they're synergetic, absolutely. The yin and yang of, 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 uh, of togetherness and they allow you, I think, to yeah, to reset and to tune in to to that ratio we talked about of who you are and who you want to be.